Greetings everyone. On today's installment of Physics is Fun, we are going to talk about refraction, which is chapter 18 in your book. And if I can get the slides to advance. So imagine you're on a skateboard heading from the sidewalk towards some grass at an angle. Your front axle is depicted before and after entering the grass. Your right contacts the grass first and slows down but your left wheel is still moving quickly on the sidewalk. This causes a turn towards the normal. If you skated from grass to sidewalk, the same path would be followed. In this case, your right wheel would reach the sidewalk first and speed up, but your left wheel would still be moving more slowly. The result this time would be turning away from the normal. The normal line being, you know, the line that's perpendicular between the grass and the sidewalk. So skating from sidewalk to grass is like traveling from air to a more optically dense medium like glass or water. The slower light travels in the new medium, the more it bends towards the normal. Light traveling from water to air speeds up and bends away from the normal. As with a skateboard, light traveling along the normal will change, but speed, change speed but no, not direction. So here's a little graphic to show you what this very long wordy paragraph just said. Here's your sidewalk, here's your grass. We're looking at it from the top. You take your skateboard and you move along and your right wheel is gonna hit the grass. Here's a normal line. It's not a very perpendicular normal line, but imagine that it's perpendicular. So as your right wheel hits the grass, it's gonna start moving more slowly, but your left wheel is still moving fast. So you start to turn towards the normal line, start bending in this way, like towards the normal, towards the normal, right after you go in the grass. And it's gonna look something like this. So here's your original path. Here's your new path through the grass. So you turn and you go at more of an angle. And when you come out of the grass on the other side, you're gonna start going exactly the same way as you did before. Because this wheel here is still gonna be in the grass and it's gonna be more slowly but this wheel's gonna hit the sidewalk first and speed up, so you're gonna turn back away from the normal. So you're gonna end up going like in the same path. And here, you can see I've drawn in the incidence angle and the refracted angle. This time, they're not equal. They're going to be different, but we're gonna have an equation that relates these two. So light works the same way. So refraction is when light bends as it passes from one medium into another. When light traveling through air passes into the glass block, it is refracted towards the normal line. Here comes the light, hits the block. Here's the normal line. We always measure the incident angle from the normal. So here's your incident angle. Now it's gonna to bend towards the normal and this angle is gonna be smaller, the refracted angle here. And you draw on another normal line and now this is going to be your new incident angle. So this incident angle and this refracted angle are the same because they're both in the same medium. When the angles are not in the same medium, they're gonna be different. So when light passes back out of the glass into the air, it is refracted away from the normal line. So at this time, it's going back into the air, it speeds up, so it's refracted away from the normal line. So this theta r is bigger than this theta i. But this theta r and this theta i are gonna be same because they are in the same medium. The index of refraction, which the letter N is used to signify this in equations, is defined as the speed of light, which is defined, or which we give, denote as C in equations, in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium, because in the medium it's going to move slower. Or mathematically, it looks like this. The index of refraction equals C over V. So N equals C over V. And the speed of light is roughly three times 10 to the eight meters per second, which if you do the scientific notation out, that's 300 million meters per second, which is pretty darn fast. And we see this all the time. Like if you have a glass of water and stick a straw in it, you notice that it looks like it's cut in half and part of it shifted down. Like this is refraction at work. Here are a couple indexes of refraction that we'll be using in class uh, material. So in a vacuum, the index of refraction is one. In air, it's slightly higher. 
water, it's higher still, glass, diamond, ruby, iced, etc. So knowing the last equation, which was n equals c over v, what is the speed of light inside of a diamond? So you take the speed of light, you rearrange this equation to solve for v, so you get v equals c over n. So you do 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 2.417, and you get 1.24 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. What is the speed of light inside of water? Pause now and figure this out on your own. I'll wait for you to pause. And now I'll continue, because I know all of you were diligent and paused and figured this out on your own. So you do the same thing, V equals C over N, speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by the index of refraction of water. So 3, point, or 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 1.33, and you get 2.26 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So as I said, we're going to have an equation that relates the index of, or sorry, the uh, angle of incidence to the angle of refraction, and that is called Snell's law. So Snell's law relates the indices of refraction and of the two media to the directions of propagation in terms of the angles to the normal. Or it just boils down to something like this. Your incidence angle, here's your angle of refraction. Each of these different media, we'll call this air, we'll call this glass for now, has their own special n, which we'll call n1 and n2. And this is Snell's law in a nutshell. I'll give you a prettier one because we don't like using Greek letters, alpha and beta. So here's just another picture depicting that 60 degrees, it enters the glass, you get about 34.5, and when it leaves the glass, it's back to 60 degrees. Same thing for water, 60 degrees to 40.6, and it changes to 60 degrees. So here's Snell's law, the one we'll be using. So Snell's law states that a ray of light bends in such a way that the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction is constant. So mathematically, it looks like this. The index of refraction of the incident media, which you know in the last picture was air, times the sine of the index, or sorry, the sine of the angle of incidence equals the index of refraction in the media that we're transferring the light to times the sine of the angle of refraction. So here, Ni is the index of refraction in the original medium, and Nr is the index in the medium the light enters, theta i and theta r, the angles of incidence refraction respectively. And this is a picture of Snell with a weird first name. So goal, here's a problem for you. Find the angular displacement of the ray after having passed through the prism. So hence, find the first angle of refraction using Snell's law. So we have a ray coming in, it's hitting the glass, and then it's going down here. I give you the indexes of refraction for both of these. The index of refraction of air is 1, and glass is 1.5. So, <coughs> you find the index of refraction here. Since this angle is 30, this angle in here is going to be 30. Plug that into our formula, and you get this. So now we need to find this angle in here. So if this angle is 90.4712, we can find this angle easily using geometry. Don't worry, I'll make these problems a little easier whenever we're doing them in class. To find the second angle of incidence, which is this guy right here, which would be 90 minus this, and you get 10.5288. Now that we have that, finding this angle is easy. You get 15.9. I'll do a problem uh, like this in class. Sorry, I didn't work this one out. Here's just some examples. Uh, here's some light going into a glass box filled with water. 
you see the light bends. So the wave comes in, now the waves slow down where they first hit here. But these waves are still traveling faster, so that's why it bends. Also, uh, like if we look at fish in a pond, the fish is actually here, but we see it here because of the index refraction. So this is the actual object, and this is the image formed because of uh, refraction. Or, you know, here's a guy, he's treasure hunting. He sees the treasure chest here, but it's actually down at the bottom. And that's refraction at work. All right, time you see the sun setting, see how it looks all globular and oval-like, but we know the sun is pretty spherical. It looks like this because of refraction. And the same thing when the uh, sunlight enters the Earth's atmosphere, it's also refracted. So we see the sun here, but it's actually over here. Kind of cool. Uh, using refraction, you can also talk about a critical angle. So when light passes through a medium of high refractive index into a medium of lower refractive index, the incident angle of the light waves become an important factor. If the incident angle increases past a specific value, it will reach a point where the angle is so large that no light is refracted into the medium of lower refractive index. The four yellow light rays all have an angle of incidence, which we're just going to call I here, low enough to pass through the interface between the two media. However, the two red light rays have incident angles that exceed the critical angle, which is approximately 41 degrees in this picture, and are reflected either into the boundary between the media, like right along this boundary here, or back into the refractive index medium. Basically what that says in a nutshell is at some critical angle, light is not going to escape this media right here. So this light, the yellow light rays are able to escape. These red ones don't escape. They're either transferred along the surface or they're, they go back into the original media. Does anybody know why this is important? I'm sure a lot of you are actually using this right now. We'll talk about that in a second, though. So the incident angle that causes the refractor rate to skim right along the boundary of a substance is known as the critical angle, which we denote as theta c. The critical angle is the angle of incidence that produces an angle of refraction of 90 degrees. So the refractive angle will be 90 degrees. So here comes the incidence. We measure from the normal, so the refracted angle. This is going to be here, 90 degrees. If the angle of incidence exceeds the critical angle, the ray is completely reflected and does not enter the new media. So here, exceeding the critical angle, it's reflected back in. Now, a critical angle only exists when light is attempting to penetrate a medium of higher optical density than it is currently traveling in. So that would mean that theta, or sorry, NR has to be bigger than NI. So it has to be uh, higher density. So from Snell's law, we have the index of refraction, which is inside this media, which is Ni in this case, times the sine of the critical angle equals M2 sine of 90. So what we're trying to find here is theta C. Because we know that the refracted angle, this guy, is 90 degrees, because that's where our critical angle is going to occur. So since sine of 90 equals 1, we can just get rid of this guy, and we just have n1 sine of theta c equals n2. And solving for the critical angle, you get the critical angle equals the inverse sine of n2 over n1. So this is when total internal reflection occurs. So that occurs when light attempts to pass from a more optically dense medium to a less optically dense medium at an angle greater than the critical angle. When this occurs, there is no refraction. So it doesn't refract, it only reflects. So it's like it's hitting a mirror. So total internal refraction can be used for practical applications like fiber optics, which I said some of you are probably using right now if you uh, have Verizon Fios internet because Fios stands for fiber optics. So here's a critical angle sample problem. So I want you to calculate the critical angle for the diamond air boundary. So go back to the index of refraction and find that real quick. 
I'll pause while you pause, and then I'll work it out for you, because I know you're also very good students, and you love doing problems like these. And you know that practice makes perfect. So now that you've calculated the critical angle, I will calculate it for you. So we take our formula, theta c equals the inverse sine of nr over ni, or n2 over ni. R, n, R in this case is 1 because it's the air. R n i is 2.42 because it's diamond. You plug that into your handy dandy calculator because who likes to do inverse signs in their head? And you get 24.4 degrees. So anytime this angle in here is greater than 24.4 degrees, you're going to get total internal reflection. So here's some stuff on fiber optics. Uh, fiber optic lines are strands of glass for transparent fibers that allow the transmission of light and digital information over long distances. They are used for the telephone system, cable TV, the internet, medical imaging, and mechanical engineering inspection. Optical fibers have many advantages over copper wires. They are cheaper, they are thinner, they are lighter, and they are more flexible. They don't burn since they use light signals instead of electrical signals. They don't get all hot and melt and shit. So light signals from one fiber do not interfere with signals in nearby fibers, which means clearer TV reception or phone conversations. So fiber optics are often long strands of very pure glass. They are very thin, about the size of a human hair. Hundreds of thousands of them are arranged in bundles or optical cables that can transmit light greater distances. There are three main parts to an optical fiber. First, you have the core. It's the thin glass center where light travels, this guy in here. You have the cladding, sounds like a Scottish war implement, which is optical material with a lower index refraction than the core that surrounds the core that reflects light back into the core. So it does not, it's just going to reflect the light that wants to leave the core and push it back into the core so it all bounces inside. Then you have this buffer coating. It's a plastic coating on the outside of nickel fiber to protect it from damage. Because, you know, glass is kind of brittle. So you need something to protect it. So here's a little schematic of how it works. Light travels through the core of a fiber octet by continually reflecting off the cladding. Due to total internal ref uh, reflection, the cladding does not absorb any of the light allowing the light to travel over great distances. Some of the light signal will degrade over time due to impurities in the glass. So here comes the light. It just bounces all off this cladding through the glass and f makes your internet work. There are two types of optical fibers. There are single mode fibers that transmit one signal per fiber, which is used in cable and TV, and multi-mode fibers that transmit multiple signals per fiber, and that's used in your computers. And here's an actual picture of some internal reflection. Pretty neat. I can probably do this in class for you too, though it's pretty bright in there. So the following picture shows the total reflection of light inside the glass block. The light enters the glass block from the lower right and travels in a zigzag way inside the glass block to, by total reflection. And I'm sure you guys have seen these, like if you go to Spencer's or something, like all these little glass things with the light at the end, like those are actually uh, fiber optic tubes. And that's how they work too, just bouncing the light off the inside. You can actually like see the image of something through an optical fiber, even though like the uh, optical fiber might bend. Here's a little bee. Let me see the bee's face. And that's it. We'll do some problems in class. Thank you for watching. See you guys later.